What's going on everybody? I hope you're all well and welcome back to Dragon Age Origins. As always, this is not a main episode of the Let's Play, this is going to be a Codex reading episode. If that's not something you're interested in, then click away now and wait for the next main episode of the Let's Play. If it is, let's read up on some culture and history of Ferelden and the Fade and see what we can learn and get our nerd on. So we'll start with creatures. We have Gollum. Once a crucial part of Ozamar's defenses, Gollums have all but vanished as the secret to their manufacture was lost over a thousand years ago. What few golems remain are guarded closely by the Shaper, brought out when the battle with the Darkspawn grows desperate enough to risk their loss. No one now would sell a golem for any price, but in ancient times, dwarves sold many golems to the Magister Lords of Tevinter. They are devastating weapons in war, living siege engines capable of hurling boulders like a catapult or plowing through enemy lines like an earthquake. Yeah, golems are very hefty. Interesting that the dwarves sold a bunch of them to the Magister Lords of Tevinta. You would think that the dwarves, given that they are immune to magic the way that they are, would be uh, pretty skeptical of Tevinta. Mm. Then again, it is dwarves. They do like gold. Maybe they just sell to everybody because they did business with the Alamar tribes too. And they do peddle their goods to the surface pretty much everywhere, even though they don't set foot up here themselves. Wisp. A great deal is made of the most powerful demons those that create abominations, and those that have changed the history of Thedas. It is often forgotten that not all demons are such awe-inspiring beings. Some that break through the cracks in the veil into our world are known as wisps, a sliver of a thought that once was. A wisp is a demon that has lost its power. Either it has existed in our world for too long without finding a true host, or it has been destroyed, often, so we found, by other demons. What remains of its mind clings tightly to the one concept that created it, a hatred of all things living. While its ability to target a living creature is limited, these wisps often mindlessly attack when encountered in the Fade. In the living world, they often have been known to maliciously lure the living into dangerous areas, being mistaken for lanterns or other civilized light sources. This does, however, seem to be the very limit of their cunning. In the journal of former senior enchanter Malleus, once of the Cleric of Ravain, declared apostate in 920 Dragon Age. Is uh, Malleus the apostate that was interviewing the Desire Demon? I think it might be, the one that got seduced. Could be Malleus, I'm not 100% sure. But we have plenty to read in here. So, the Black City. No traveler to the Fade can fail to spot the Black City. It is one of the few constants of that ever-changing place. No matter where one might be, the city is visible, always far off, for it seems that the only rule of geography in the Fade is that all points are equidistant from the Black City. The chant teaches that the Black City was once the seat of the Maker, from whence he ruled the Fade, left empty when men turned away from him. Dreamers do not go there, nor do spirits, even the most powerful demons seem to avoid the place. It was golden and beautiful once, so the story goes until a group of powerful Magister Lords from Tevinter Imperium devised a means to breaking in. When they did so, their presence defiled the city, turning it black, which was perhaps the least of their worries. From Beyond the Veil, Spirits and Demons by Enchanter Merdromo. It's interesting that the Black City is always at the center of the entirety of the Fade, and demons and spirits all seem to stay away from it, which is the irony really of the fact that men can't seem to wait to get there. Like the world of man, but everything in the Fade does its best to avoid it. Hierarchy of the Circle It is no simple matter safeguarding ordinary men from mages and mages from themselves. Each circle tower must have some measure of self-government, for it is ever the Maker's will that men be given the power to take responsibility for our own actions, to sin and fail, as well as to achieve the highest grace and glory on our own strength. You, who will be tasked with the protection of the circle must be aware of its workings. The first enchanter is the heart of any tower. He will determine the course his circle will take. He will choose which apprentices may be tested and made full mages, and you will work most closely with him. Assisting the first enchanter will be the senior enchanters, a small council of the most trusted and experienced magi in the tower. From this group, the next first enchanter is always chosen. Beneath the council are the enchanters, these are the teachers and mentors of the tower, and you must get to know them in order to keep your finger on the pulse of the circle, for the enchanters will always know what is happening among the children. All those who have passed their harrowing but have not taken apprentices are mages. This is where most trouble in the circle lies, in the idleness and inexperience of youth. 
The untested apprentices are the most numerous denizens of any tower, but they more often pose threats to themselves due to their lack of training than to anyone else. Knight Commander Serene of the Chantry Templars in a letter to his successor. So right there you see that if uh, mages are constantly taking their heroin, however most of the uh, most of the circle's inhabitants are people who haven't taken their heroin, you would imagine that not all the mages are staying in the tower 24-7, which I've mentioned a couple times, but they can leave. Once they pass the heroin and they become full mages, they are welcome to leave when they want, they just have to return eventually. But you're not like imprisoned like a bird in a cage for life, you do get to take adventures like win win has been all over the place when is actually a very good example of why the circles shouldn't just be abandoned and abolished they can work when is a glowing beacon of that history of the circle it is a truth universally acknowledged that nothing is more successful at expiring a person to mischief as being told not to do something true that unfortunately the chantry of the divine age had some trouble with obvious truths Although it did not outlaw magic, quite the contrary, as the Chantry relied upon magic to kindle the eternal flame which burns in every brazier and every Chantry, it relegated mages to lighting candles and lamps, perhaps occasional dusting of rafters and eaves. I will give my readers a moment to contemplate how well such a role satisfied the mages of the time, considering the ego most of them have, I'm sure they were very distraught about that, especially the dusting part, they wouldn't want to muddy their pretty robes. It surprised absolutely no one when the mages of Balrayo, in protest, snuffed the sacred flames of the cathedral and barricaded themselves inside the choir loft. No one, that is, but divine Ambrosia II, who was outraged and attempted to order an exalted march upon her own cathedral. Even her most devout Templars discouraged that idea. For twenty-one days, the fires remained unlit while negotiations were conducted, legend tells us, by shouting back and forth from the loft. You see, and now anybody who thinks the Templars are all just mindless uh, chimps, essentially, they will just dogs on a leash, they will just attack and slaughter mages any whim they get. You see here that the Templars actually refuse the divine and refuse to go slaughter all these mages, and they actually negotiated with them. So, again, not all Templars are the villains that certain games and certain fans of said games paint them out to be. The mages went cheerily into exile in a remote fortress outside of the capital, where they would be kept under the watchful eye of the Templars and a council of their own elder magi. Outside of normal society and outside of the Chantry, the mages would form their own close society, the Circle, separated from the first time in human history. From Of Fires, Circles, and Templars, A History of Magic in the Chantry by Sister Patrine, Chantry Scholar. So the mages are actually the ones that negotiated for the circle and helped establish it the uh the mages and the templars agreed on this together so it's not like we just rounded them up one day and stuffed them all in towers they wanted to be in these towers to have their own little side piece from society now the new generation of mages may disagree with this but it was their people that formed those the harrowing among apprentices of the circle nothing is regarded with more fear than the harrowing Little is known about this rite of passage, and that alone would be cause for dread, but it is well understood that only those apprentices who pass this trial are ever seen again. They return as full members of the Circle of Magi. Of those who fail, nothing is known. Perhaps they are sent away in disgrace. Perhaps they are killed on the spot. I heard one patently ridiculous rumor among the Circle at Ravain, which claimed that failed apprentices were transformed into pigs, fattened up, and served at dinner to the senior enchanters but I could find no evidence that the Ravani Circle ate any particular quantity of pork from In Pursuit of Knowledge, The Travels of a Chantry Scholar by Brother Genetive. They do in fact not turn the failed, <laughs> failed apprentices into pork and eat them at dinner. The reason why you uh, tend to never see them again after they fail is because the heroine is a direct confrontation with the demon. They have to prove that they can resist possession, and of course if they can't, they become possessed, and the Templars then do their duty. That is the reason the failed apprentices are never seen again. I imagine they do whatever needs to be done with the body to keep the other mages from finding that out. But I will point out again that it is the mages that set this up. That is not Templar doing. Templars aren't forcing mages into some possession conflict. The first enchanters, the higher-ups, they're all on board with it too. It is not like a, a thing forced upon them. Lyrium. More than half the wealth of Ozumar comes from a single, extremely rare substance. 
Ithurium. The Chantry believe it to be the waters of the Fade, mentioned in the Canticle of Therenides, the very stuff of creation itself, from whence the Maker fashioned the world. Only a handful of mining caste families hazard extracting the ore, finding veins in the stone quite literally by ear, for in its raw form, Lyrium sings, and the discerning can hear the sound even through solid rock. Even though dwarves have a natural resistance, raw Lyrium is dangerous for all but the most experienced of the mining caste to handle. Even for dwarves, exposure to the unprocessed mineral can cause deafness or memory loss. For humans and elves, direct contact with lyrium ore produces nausea, blistering of the skin, and dementia. Mages cannot even approach unprocessed lyrium, doing so is invariably fatal. So you get, if you're not a dwarf with that natural resistance, you get dementia, it just straight up kills mages. Which I suppose is the reason why Tranquil are the ones that can fold lyrium, and that's not raw lyrium, but they're still the only ones that can do that. Despite its dangers, lyrium is the single most valuable mineral currently known. In the Tevinter Imperium, it has been known to command a higher price than diamond. The dwarves sell very little of the processed mineral to the surface, giving the greater portion of what they mine to their own smiths, who use it in the forging of all truly superior dwarven weapons and armor. What processed lyrium is sold on the surface goes only to the Chantry, who strictly control the supply. From the Chantry, it is dispensed both to the Templars, who make use of it in tracking and fighting Maleficarum, and to the Circle. In the hands of the Circle, Lyrium reaches its fullest potential. Their Formari craftsmen transform it into an array of useful items from the practical, such as magically hardened stone for construction, to the legendary silver armors of King Kalanad. If you remember, King Kalanad wore a uh, enchanted silver playmail set when he conquered the lands and united them. When mixed into liquid and ingested, Lyrium allows mages to enter the Fade fully aware, unlike all others who reach it only while dreaming. Such potions can also be used to aid in the casting of especially taxing spells, for a short time granting a mage far greater power than he normally wields. Lyrium has its costs, however. Prolonged use becomes addictive, the cravings unbearable. Over time, Templars grow disoriented, incapable of distinguishing memory from present, or dream from waking. They frequently become paranoid, as their worst memories and nightmares haunt their waking hours. Mages have additionally been known to suffer physical mutation. The Magister Lords of the Tevinter Imperium were widely reputed to have been so affected by their years of lyrium use that they could not be recognized by their own kin, nor even as creatures that had once been human. From In Pursuit of Knowledge, The Travels of a Chantry Scholar by Brother Genitive. So lyrium has... A lot of many many uses it can make you stronger faster it aids templars in all of their endeavors hunting maleficarum and keeping tabs on the mages but it also comes with a high cost it's kind of like heroin when you're on it it'll be you'll be on cloud nine when you come off it that's when the problems start to happen or prolonged use like the the templars stop being able to what did it say tell dream from reality their memories haunt them their worst nightmares 24 7 in their heads you, uh, you have to wonder if the Chantry peddling that kind of lyrium to the Templars 24-7 might be why here and there you do get abuses from Templars. You know, they're constantly dreaming about this Maleficarum they killed 20 years ago and then they see a mage casting a fireball. You imagine it can cause some problems. The Cardinal Rules of Magic You must not be under the misimpression that magic is all-powerful. There are limits, and not even the greatest mages may overcome them. No one, for instance, has found any means of traveling, either over great distances or small ones, beyond putting one foot in front of the other. The immutable nature of the physical world prevents this. So no, you may not simply pop over to Minrathus to borrow a cup of sugar, nor may you magic the essay you forgot in the apprentice dormitory to your desk. You will simply have to be prepared. So this explains in a way why there's no teleportation and things in the main story. You do have to walk by foot or horseback. Similarly, even when you send your mind into the Fade, your body remains behind. Only once has this barrier been overcome, and reputedly the spell required two-thirds of delirium in the Tevinter Imperium, as well as the lifeblood of several hundred slaves. The results were utterly disastrous. Finally, life is finite. A truly great healer may bring someone back from the very precipice of death, when breath and heartbeat have ceased but the spirit still clings to life. But once the spirit has fled the body, it cannot be recalled. That is no failing of your skills or power, it is simply reality. 
from the lectures of the first enchanter, Wenselius. So that has explained that nobody can be immortal, you will still die, and you cannot just pop over to Mirathus for sugar. <laughs> no teleportation and no immortality. Magic is not the fountain of youth. You can extend your life, prolong it, and bring yourself back from the brink, but once you are gone, you are gone. Right, the four schools of magic. Creation. Opposition in all things. For earth, sky. For winter, summer. For darkness, light. By my will alone is balance sundered, and the world given new life. Serenities 5-5. The school of creation, sometimes called the school of nature, is the second of the schools of matter, the balancing force and complement of entropy. Creation magic manipulates natural forces, transforming what exists and bringing new things into being. Creation requires considerable finesse, more than any other school, and is therefore rarely mastered. Those mages who have had made serious study of creation are the highest in demand, useful in times of peace as well as war. From the Four Schools, a treatise by First Enchanter Josephus. So creation, I believe, is the healing school. I'm pretty sure creation is the one that's healing, and that is the hardest to master. So Wynne is very high in demand as a mage. She's really up there because she has mastered creation. She's a creation mage, after all. So she's really good at what she does, one of the higher-ups. The Four Schools of Magic. Entropy. To you, my second born, I grant this gift. In your heart shall burn an unquenchable flame. All consuming and never satisfied. The Renades 5 1. Again, I love that line. In your heart shall burn an unquenchable flame. It's just so cool. If you were going to get some kind of quote from Dragon Age tattooed on you somewhere, that would be the one. <laughs> the second of the two schools of matter. Entropy is the opposing force of creation. For this reason, it is often called the school of negation. Nothing lives without death. Time inevitably brings an end to all things in the material world. And yet in this ending is the seed of a beginning. A river may flood its banks, causing havoc, but bring new life to its floodplain. The fire that burns a forest ushers in new growth. And so it is with entropic magic that we manipulate the forces of erosion, decay, and destruction to create anew. From the Four Schools, a treatise by First Enchanter Josephus. The Four Schools of Magic, Primal. Those who oppose thee shall know the wrath of heaven, Field and forest shall burn, the sea shall rise and devour them, the wind shall tear their nations from the face of the earth, lightning shall rain down from the sky, they shall cry out to their false gods and find silence. Andraste 719 Sometimes called the school of power, the primal school is the second of the schools of energy, balanced by spirit, and concerns the most visible and tangible forces of nature itself. This is the magic of war. Fire, ice, and lightning. Devastation. This is what the vast majority imagines when they hear the word magic. From the Four Schools, a treatise by First Enchanter Josephus. So that's your fireballs, your lightning spells, all that good stuff. The Four Schools of Magic. Spirit. And the voice of the Maker shook the Fade, saying, In my image I have wrought my firstborn. You have been given dominion over all that exists. By your will all things are done. Yet you do nothing. The realm I have given you is formless, ever-changing. Serenities 5-4 The first of the two schools of energy, spirit is opposed by the primal school. It is the school of mystery, the ephemeral school. This is the study of the invisible energies which surround us at all times, yet are outside of nature. It is from the fate itself that this magic draws its power. Students of this school cover everything from direct manipulation of mana and spell energies to the study and summoning of spirits themselves. By its nature, an esoteric school, as most others know virtually nothing about the Fade, studies of spirit magic are often misunderstood by the general populace, or even confused for blood magic, an unfortunate fate for a most useful branch of study. From the Four Schools, a treatise by First Enchanted Josephus. So, spirit magic is often confused with the uh, blood mage somehow i'm not sure how that works spirit has things like uh i believe spirit is horror weakness paralysis all those things i believe is the spirit school we would have to check on that uh beyond the veil spirits and demons it is challenging enough for the casual observer to tell the difference between the fade and the creatures that live within it let alone between one type of spirit and another in truth there is little that distinguishes them even for the most astute mages and spirits are not physical entities, and are therefore not restricted to recognizable forms, or even having a form at all, 
one can never tell for certain what is alive and what is merely part of the scenery. It is therefore advisable for the inexperienced researcher to greet all objects he encounters. We'll say hello to your lawn chairs. Typically, we misuse the term spirit to refer to only the benign, or at least less malevolent, creatures of the Fade. But in truth, all the denizens of the realm beyond the veil are spirits. As the chant of light notes, everything within the Fade is a mimicry of our world, a poor imitation, for the spirits do not remotely understand what they are copying. It is no surprise that much of the fate appears like a manuscript translated from Tevinter into Orlesian, and back again by drunken initiates. In general, spirits are not complex, or rather, they are not complex as we understand such things. Each one seizes upon a single feat of a si sorry, each one seizes upon a single facet of human experience rage, hunger, compassion, hope, etc. This one idea becomes their identity. We classify as demons those spirits who identify themselves with darker human emotions and ideas. So there's actually nice spirits, for as much as they can identify as uh, pride, hunger, rage, they could also technically identify as kindness and compassion. Any human emotion they can identify as, and that becomes their entire identity, so there are spirits of compassion out there. The most common and weakest form of demon one encounters in the Fade is the rage demon. They are much like perpetually boiling kettles, for they exist only to vent hatred, but rarely have an object to hate. Somewhat above these are the hunger demons, who do little but eat or attempt to eat everything they encounter, including other demons. This is rarely successful. Then there are the sloth demons. These are the first intelligent creatures one typically finds in the Fade. They are dangerous only on those rare occasions that they can be induced to get up and do harm. Desire demons are more clever, and far more powerful using all forms of bribery to induce mortals into their realms. Wealth, love, vengeance, whatever lies closest to your heart. The most powerful demons yet encountered are the pride demons, perhaps because they, among all their kind, most resemble men. Pride is the root of all sin, after all. From Beyond the Veil, Spirits and Demons by Enchanter Merdramel. But it's funny that sloth demons really aren't that dangerous because most of the time they're too lazy to kill you. <laughs> You do have to watch out for pride demons and desire demons, as it said. There's going to be a couple pride demons in the game, actually, that we will be running into. The Veil. I detest this notion that the Veil is some manner of invisible curtain that separates the world of the living from the world of the spirits. Whether it be called the Fade or the Beyond is a matter of racial politics and I refuse to indulge in at the moment. There is no this side and that side when it comes to the Veil. One cannot think of it as a physical thing or a barrier or even a shimmering wall of holy light. Thank you very much for that image, your perfection. Think of the veil instead as opening one's eyes. Before you opened them, you saw our world as you see it now. Static, solid, unchanging. Now that they are open, you see our world as the spirits see it. Chaotic, ever-changing. A realm where the imagined and the remembered have as much substance as that which is real. More, in fact. A spirit sees everything is defined by will and memory, and this is why they are so very lost when they cross the veil. In our world, imagination has no substance. Objects exist independently of how we remember them, or what emotions we associate with them. Mages alone possess the power to change the world with their minds, and perhaps this forms the nature of a demon's attraction to them. Who can say? Regardless, the act of passing through the veil is much more about changing one's perceptions than a physical transition. The veil is an idea, it is the act of transition itself, and it is only the fact that both living beings and spirits find the transition difficult that gives the veil any credence as a physical barrier at all. From a dissertation on the fade as a physical manifestation by Mourinho, senior enchanter of the Minratha Circle of Magi, 655 Steel. I actually had to go back while I was reading that and double check that I read that correctly. It did in fact say that called the fade or the beyond is a matter of racial politics that he refuses to indulge in. That's uh I thought I misspoke for a second, but that is what it says. Culture and history. We have just the one it seems. The Tevinter Imperium. The Imperium is little more than a dilapidated old Slatin crouching in the far north of Thedas drunkenly cursing at passerbys to recall her faded beauty. 
one can see that Minrathus was once the centre of the world, the vestiges of her power and artistry yet stand, but they are buried in the layers of filth that the Imperium's decadence has accumulated over the ages. The Majocracy live in elegant stone towers, literally elevated above the stench of the slaves and peasants below. The outskirts of Minrathus are awash in a sea of refugees turned destitute by the never-ending war between the Imperium and the Canari. And yet the Imperium survives. Whether with sword or magic, Tevinta remains a force to be reckoned with. Minrathus has been besieged by men, by Canari, by Andraste herself, and never fallen. From In Pursuit of Knowledge, The Travels of a Chantry Scholar by Brother Genetive, we have actually never been to the Tevinter Imperium in any of the Dragon Age games, which is, I guess, the one thing you could be excited about uh, the Bale God for, is the fact that you actually get to go to... Uh, Tevinter, finally, but... Yeah, I was just getting rid of the control section there. The last thing we have to check is notes. What do we have in notes? It said we had one, but I'm not seeing it. Oh, it took us back to the top. That's why my mistake. We have two in notes. Desire and need. Notice of censure. Templar dress. Your remarks in front of the recruits are only the latest in a series of troubling events. I am beginning to suspect that you may not be suited to the devotional requirements of training. Perhaps it is time for a personal evaluation of your career path within the Templars. I will schedule some time after the current deployment to discuss options elsewhere in the organization. Attendant Sarand, assistant to Knight Commander Gregor. The note is scribbled in the corner. Attendant who? Options. Code for dead end. Duty on a hedge mage hunt in the Banorn. But whoever Templar Drass is, they weren't very happy with him, and since it's called Desire and Need, I imagine Templar Drass is the knight we killed when we freed from the uh, Desire Demon, I would imagine. Extracurricular Studies I have the utmost sympathy for what happened to your charge, but it is beyond the Circle's ability to anticipate every obscure demise that an apprentice might face, especially involving methods outside the already extensive realm of magical study. We simply don't have the room for additional training facilities, and there are concerns about becoming too inclusive that I will not elaborate on. The request is denied. First Enchanter Sinclair Notice herewith that the exercise area on the fourth floor shall serve as a permanent berthing for the facilities that accommodate their particular training requirements are already on hand. Okay, I butchered the hell out of that. <laughs> Notice herewith that the exercise area on the fourth floor shall serve as permanent berthing for the Templar garrison stationed at the tower. Since facilities that accommodate their particular training requirements are already on hand, they will be assuming an even closer watch over Circle Affairs. Enchanter Bergen's optional weapons training is cancelled until further notice. Enchanter Bergen has additionally stepped down from teaching duties. First Enchanter Sinclair. But it seems like they just made room for the Templars. I'm not sure what this is exactly referring to here. The uh, don't have room for additional training facilities and there are concerns about becoming too inclusive that I will not elaborate on. I'm a little confused on what that means. I assume this is referring to Templars and uh, Mages fraternizing. I'm guessing that is what this means. I'm sure it happens a lot, right? Templars, Mages, the whole like men and women being around each other, eventually feelings are going to form kind of thing. I imagine a lot of Templars tend to fall in love with their charges and I imagine conversely, I imagine a lot of Mages kind of fall in love with their Templars. Alas, that seems to be the end of the codexes, so I'm going to wrap this one here, guys. And in the next episode, we'll jump right back into finishing off the fade, so thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe, leave a like and a comment. If you want to support the cause and help improve the channel, there is a tip link in the description below. Otherwise, stay tuned, and I'll see you guys soon with more Dragon Age Origins. Have a good day, guys. Take care.